Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I appreciate um, you all taking the time out of your day to listen to me ramble about food resources. Thank you to Baroness Disa for setting these classes up. They're always great. This one's going to be a little bit different than my last one, which was outside in front of a hot fire trying to cook eggs with technology on one of the hottest days of the year, and it was not it was, it was lots of fun, but it was, I don't want to have to repeat that. So now I'm down here sitting in my library, um, well, half of my library, um, and where the food history section is, and we're going to look at some food resources. So first of all, I wanted to welcome you guys in virtual land and, and say hello. Um, questions in the chat. There'll be time for questions in each section. And then at the very end, what we're gonna do is, is address your questions specifically. And I can pull specific resources off that you might be interested in. I have a lot of, a lot of books. So if you're interested in a specific time period or culture, I probably have a resource on it. So first off, I wanted to introduce you. Let me see, there's 28 of you and I'm trying to figure out how many of you I know, but it's sort of hard from here. I'll just give you a brief overview of who I am. So I'm Maestro Eduardo Francesco Maria Lucrezia. I um, am a member of the Order of the Laurel and the Order of the Pelican, and I'm a Lion of Ontier. I've been in the SCA for 37 years. I started out in the SCA in Atlantia, and then I moved back home to Ontier. That's where my family's from. And then I've also lived in Kaid for a year. Um, so I've lived in three different kingdoms, but almost entirely in Ontier. Um, I've done all sorts of different types of arts and sciences over that 37 years. It's, long, it's more than half my life. Um, and for the last about 20, maybe 25 years, I've been super focused on food history and cookery. Um, specifically, I'm interested in um, cookery from the Italian peninsula from about 1450 to 1510. Um, my main area of study is Martino um, and um, and the other associated works of Martino, which we'll probably talk about a little bit. Um, modernly, I own a technology consulting firm um, and I own a um, health and wellness business. Um, and then I also on the side write articles and papers, food history stuff. So you probably read some of the things that I've written. They've been in um, the Journal of Italian Food and Wine. I've had two papers published in the Oxford Symposium papers. I've um, given papers at RSA, which is the Renaissance Society of America with um, Ken Albala um, uh, being the other presenter there. And I've also written um, several articles um, for PPC, um, Pettis Propus Culinaris. So I have a pretty big background in food history. If you're looking for things that I've written, they're either under David McDonald, which was my maiden name, I guess, um, David Walden or David Huffman Walden. So um, those are where you can find my um, papers. And we'll talk, we'll, I'll pull some of them um, and show you where, where you can get them. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit first about food history resources. So there's all sorts of types of resources. We're mainly going to focus today on printed resources, primary sources, secondary sources, menus, those sorts of things. But there's other resources that you should be looking at that will supplement, obviously, archaeological resources, things like grains and um, this um, shards of pottery and that sort of thing. There's physical remains, utensils, pots. I was going to bring my, I've got a 15th century pot I forgot to bring down. And then also, you shouldn't forget about the kitchens that are uh, that are remain in situ, especially in the Renaissance. So we have places like the Davanzati Palace in Florence that has a, a perfectly preserved Italian kitchen, and Hampton Court and those sorts of places that have been restored um, and can be used as resources. But we're going to focus today almost entirely on written resources. We've got I've got sixteen or so shelves of. Um, food history 
um, resources that we'll go through and then you can ask me questions and stuff about them. So the first thing we're going to do is go over the agenda. So I'm going to talk first about what I think makes a good resource and then I'll probably ask you to what what your what you think a good resource is. Then we'll do a quick tour of the library. So I'll I'll take the camera and I'll go through each shelf and they're all just been organized <laughs> into specific topics. So we'll talk about what's on each shelf in general. I might pull one or two books as we go. And then we'll have a third section where you can ask questions about resources. If you're interested in a specific time period or culture, you can ask me about it and I'll try to pull a resource that might be good for you and that sort of thing. So it's a, it'll be interactive as well. Um, so first off, let's talk about what makes a good resource. Um, and I think that you really, before you answer that question, you have to ask yourself, what are you using it for? Because a resource has to be contextualized to the use. So a resource that is good for me when I am translating a primary source recipe from the Italian Renaissance might not be a good resource for you. Are you using it for, because you want to cook a feast? Are you using it because you want to do your own redactions? Are you using it because you're putting together a scholarly or arts and sciences paper, um, research paper? All those things need to be put into play before you decide whether or not it's a good resource. Um, Normally what we do in this class when I teach it in person is that I bring a whole bunch of books and I ask you in small groups to pick two or three and tell me why it's a good resource and why it what the lack or the failings of it are. So I'm just going to get out a book. Um, I'll just well, I'll just use Scents and Flavors, which is one of my new my new favorite books. And this might actually be better if I hold it up like this. Do you said, I think it is actually, okay. yeah. Okay, then I'm gonna take, I'm gonna shut this one off so I don't have to. Sounds good. Um, I do think that it's probably, this camera is way better. So, so Sense and Flavor. So this is a, a good resource if you're looking at um, Syrian cuisine. So th that's another thing. It's a good resource if it addresses the topic that you're interested in. It could be a really great resource, but it doesn't address what you're looking at. The reason I would like, I like this book, and I think it's a really good resource, is a couple of different things. First and foremost, the first thing I do in any book is go to the back. I don't even, you know, may, I might browse through it a little bit, but I'm really looking at to make, to see what the bibliography says. The, if, if a book doesn't have a bibliography, no matter how wonderful the text is, it's really gonna be limited in its use. So you want a good bibliography. We know actually that, you know, this is translated by um, Charles Perry. And if you know anything about um, Middle Eastern cookery, Charles has a lot of um, excellent books out. He's had a long reputation. He's written a lot of articles. So that gives you a hint right off the bat that it's a good resource. But in the bibliography, he's got, really some good um, primary source resor resources in here. He's got some secondary stuff. You want to look through and see how extensive it is. This one isn't actually very extensive, but um, we know because uh, who wrote it that it's very good. I also look to make sure that it has a good index because oftentimes it'll be hard to find things. So once I've sort of established that it's, it's by a good author, one that's respected in the field, um, a good bibliography, and it's got an index that's usable, then I start looking at the text itself. If I'm, if I'm using, a, and it's a little bit different with this book because it's in Syrian and, oh, and I don't speak that, so it's hard, but even knowing that the original transcription or uh, a facsimile of the original text is side by side with the English translation, that's really critical because you can, especially if it's a romance language, especially if it's something that you um, are um, able to sort of pick, hunt and peck, 
you can you can look at people's translations and see if those choices would be the same that same thing that you would choose. Um, always a, a facsimile is always better than a transcription because there will be errors in the transcription as well. So I look at those things. And then the last thing I look at is who did the introduction to the book or who did the foreword? Um, did the author do it? Is there someone that's also supporting their, um, their work? So I look at that and the table of contents is also something. This table of contents is fabulous. And, and what's the, what are the sections of the introduction? So um, does it break the book down? Is it, is it a brief introduction? This one's fairly brief, um, but it's still, I would say this is a really good resource if you were doing um, uh, Syrian, Middle Eastern cooking, anything like that. Um, I'll show you another one that I like, um, but I have, that has a few problems. So this one is called the Neapolitan Cookbook. Um, I guess that's upside down. Is that the right way around for you guys? Or do I need to mirror? Yeah, that's the right way. Okay. Um, the Neapolitan recipe collection, um, uh, Cucina Napolitano, it's also, um, I like to refer to it as Bueller, um, the Bueller manuscript, um, because it comes um, from that library. This is an excellent um, book by Terence Scully. The problem with this book, you can look and see at the back, it's got some nice appendix, appendices. I'll show you those in a second. Um, and then the bibliography is before the appendix. The bibliography and the ingredients, it's got some really good useful tools in the back of the book. Um, his bibliography is not, it's not a bibliography, all of his um, citations are in um, footnotes, so that makes it a little harder to use. Um, and then the biggest problem with this book, even though it's fairly good, the translation's not bad, um, Scully's more interested in the comparative analysis of the texts than the translations, so I always check his translations. The biggest problem with the book is it's divided into three sections and you have to flip back and forth. So it has the original, tra original transcription in one section. It has the translation in an entire other section. And it has the commentary on each of the recipes in a third section. So when I'm reading this book, I basically do this. I had to put my fingers in here and flip back and forth because they're not side by side. So while this is an excellent resource, especially for um, late, 15th century Italian cooking, Martino related, um, it's hard to use. So this resource isn't as, as good as some of the other ones um, that we have. So um, I, those are some of the things that I look for in a uh, resource to make sure it's a um, good resource. I'm also looking at whether it's a primary resource like the ones that I just showed you, those are cookery books. So um, can I can I uh, add something in? We're having a little bit of a conversation on here um, that is kind of interesting. So somebody asked if the hardback and paperback are different. Yes. And some, yeah. Sometimes they are. If you mean of the specific of sense, sense and flavors. Yeah. There's no Arabic in the paperback. Right. So yeah. they're often different. So um, and there are like the paperback sometimes will even have other materials and a second edition versus a, a, a first edition and a second edition, third, fourth, fifth, will also sometimes add um, materials to it. So the source can change as well as the knowledge base grows. Um, I'm sometimes, not always, but sometimes I will get all the different editions of a book. <laughs> um, don't tell Brian. Um, so, I have something to compare it to, but often I just like to to have the first edition or the edition that has both the original um, manuscript and the translation. Was there another question there on resources? There was one other question. Um, a book that's strictly a facsimile of a period book, it doesn't need a bibliography, right? Right. Well, it depends it, if there's if it's just strictly a facsimile. 
not, but oftentimes there'll be an introduction to the facsimile and then they'll have put a bibliography in it as well. So let's take, for instance, this is a facsimile of Scopy. Um, and it's, ex it's just the, the facsimile, it's right from the plates. And this doesn't need uh, a bibliography at all because um, all it is is the book. And then um, the introduction to it, it's also in, the introduction is also in Italian. And um, the, he has those in footnotes. So yeah, you're correct that you don't need to have that. And then Scopy is so big that it's actually two volumes um, in the original. So yeah, th that would be that would be something that you'd look for if it's a, if it's an exact reproduction of the manuscript, then that's a great source. But um, something to think about too, we would consider that a pro this a as close to a primary source as possible. Obviously the original work would be the primary source, but this is a good primary source. But is it a primary source for food? Or is it a primary source for a cookbook? And that's really interesting conversation to have, which we can do a little bit later if people are interested, but um, there, you know, food is transitory. So it's ephemeral. It doesn't exist anymore. It's like music. Um, once it's once it's produced, once it's um, made, then it no and consumed, it no longer exists. So the the discussion around what a primary source is for a loaf of bread, for instance, um, would is hard to find. Like we do have the Pompeii um, examples, but they're carbonized and stuff. So there's not really primary sources. So as close as we can get are the original cookbooks um, to that, to, to a primary source. Let me just look here on my sheet. So, so secondary resources can also be good too. So I always, almost always look for the primary resource cookbooks. I like them in the original languages. Um, I speak several different languages, so um, it's easy for me, except if it's in Arabic, to read most of them. Um, but for instance, here we'll look at this. Here's Scully's translation of Scopy. So he does not have the, because it would be just too huge, he doesn't have the original. That's why I like to use these in combination. So I can go and look at the original recipe in the original format and then look at his translation and see how they differ. Um, and you can probably really don't be afraid um, to pick up a dictionary and start playing with that. Um, if, you, if you have any languages in your past at all, you'll be able to pick it up fairly quickly. And we're dealing with a very small amount of terms and terminology because it's specific to cooking. So once you start to get the hang of it, you'll be, especially if you're working on one specific manuscript, you'll be able to start to read it fairly quickly. So, so this one is a, good, is a good resource. Again, he's got an amazing bibliography in this one. He's got great indexes. He's got good um, appendix, appendices. Um, I really like this um, as a resource. Here's, here's what it looks like in case you want to write it down. Mid 16th century Italian cooking in Rome, but it did spread quite far and wide across the Italian peninsula. Um, the only thing I don't like about this is that I really do feel like the translation was rushed. There's some choices that I would not have made. Oftentimes, too, with the translations of, of books, the scholarly translations, they're not usually cooks. They're not usually in the kitchen. They're usually in their books. They're usually um, in the manuscript. They're usually compare, you know, they're, they come from a comparative analysis standpoint. And so the translations often aren't great um, or exact. You know, in, for instance, in the um, Milham translation, of Plotina, which I'll pull out here too. Hold on, let me put Scopy back. The Milham translation of Plotina, which is here, um, and looks like this. This is um, an excellent book if you're interested in Italian cooking uh, from the 15th century. She translates the word, um, the Latin word, 
um, urbis four or five different ways. So sometimes it's translated as herbs, sometimes it's translated as seasonings, sometimes it's translated as vegetables. So there's multiple different ways she's translated that. And um, it's an excellent um, comparative analysis of all of the existing copies of De Honesta, Plotina's book, but the translation, because she's not in the kitchen, is sometimes awkward. Also, it's Latin, and Latin's not really a cooking language. Um, so it's, you know, it's hard and you have to make assumptions. Now, it's totally fine, I believe, if she translated herbs five different ways. But I want to know, as the person that's using the book, I want to know why she translated it this way this time and another way another time because that gives us an insight into what her thinking was and why she translated that specific word in multiple different ways. There's also um, uh, a few translation um, just that are actually wrong um, when you look at it. Um, and it was just, you know, everybody's going to make a mistake. Everybody's going to make uh, 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 an overlook something. But there's a few things in here because of her lack of cooking knowledge that it's, it, it's not as good as it, as it could be. However, the comparative analysis of the Plotina works is amazing. It's even if you don't use the translation, and there's a couple of, there's one other translation of this, um, you um, should have this book if you're interested in that um, time period of cooking because the analysis is fabulous. The, um, the work cited, she doesn't have a bibliography so much as a work cited. It's sorted into primary sources and secondary sources. The index is fabulous. It's just a really good book to have. So the, and this is really considered to be the, um, the number one translation of Plotina. There's one other translation. Um, it's uh, really quick. Oh. Um, so somebody said uh, when Milhelm was at CookCon, she was absolutely appalled that people were cooking from her book. Right. Um, she well, told us she didn't, it, yeah. she didn't intend it that way at all. Um, she intend, you know, it's an it's an analysis of the books, and actually the text itself, and she's very very open about it. The text itself is actually so she has it side by side. You can see I use this a lot. I have lots of writing in it, and nobody gets to tell me I'm not allowed to write in my book because they're my books. They're your books. You're right. allowed. So, um, see, so you can see this. This side is the Latin, and then this side is the English translation. And so that's really great, but this actually isn't a transcription or a facsimile, obviously not a facsimile, of a Plotina work. She's created a, which I can't remember what she calls it in the introduction, but it's sort of an uber de honesta. She's looked at all of the editions, and there are a lot of um, editions of Plotina, and sort of made a text that typifies them all. So, um, it's not from one edition. It's a compilation of multiple editions. And it's really, her work is really about the comparative analysis of the, uh, across um, the um, corpus of De Honesta. Um, this is a really good um, a di uh, translation of Plotina, but it's really, really hard to get. Um, uh, it, 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 I don't think you can, I don't know if you can find it anymore anyhow. And it's a, it's actually a facsimile. It's the other way around. It's got the translation on this side and the facsimile on this side. Oh, and I just happened to open to the bread. Um, it's a fairly good translation. It's a solid translation. Um, it, but I, as you can see, I use the Milham a lot. If I want to look at a specific Latin word that I think might be transcribed wrong, I'll come to this because I can see it. Or I have microfilm copies of like 25 different editions of Plotina. So that I'd look at. But I was going to go, is there another question before I move on to secondary sources? I have Just a couple to... questions here. Um, 
Uh, I'm definitely interested in discussion of primary sources of food or cookbook. Primary sources of food would be archaeological resources or sources, yeah. not resources, sources. Yeah, so primary sources of, of food are the archaeological record. And um, they're not oftentimes not very, um, they don't give us a lot of insight into how things were made. So you have to remember that cooking too is a process. So uh, documenting a process is, is different than documenting uh, an item. And there's just a lot, there's just a lot to think about and unpack. And you have to, as the person that's, that's doing the research and looking at the food and ma or making the food or writing about the food, you have to come from a point of view and make that point of view very specific in your writing or in your cooking. I'm doing this because of these things and these are my assumptions around it. And you have to keep within that framework because we honestly don't have, because there's no transporter, we don't have a, a actual primary source. We don't have a, a, sto a knitted stocking in the same way that costumers might or that jewelers might. We don't have the rings. We don't have those sorts of things. We have Couples all- don't last for hundreds of years. Right. Um, we have all the things surrounding it. So you have to make assumptions and you have to be clear about the assumptions that you're making, right? So you have to be really specific about, I'm making this assumption based on these things. Um, and it will likely be an assumption. It's just a very, very interesting topic to think about and, and far beyond the scope of this class. But if we have some time at the end, we can have more of a, a back and forth. Were there any other questions? There's one other question. Um, are there schools of thought for food research as there are for other types of history research? If so, do you have, uh, do you have a feel for which scholars are the most useful? Yeah, so there's a couple of different, so it's a very new, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's a new, but food history is a very sort of new study. Um, and for a very long time, um, there wasn't a lot of, um, oh, scholarly research done into it. It was mostly a lot of dilettantes. Um, and we'll look at that when we look at some, some of the books, like f the things we had to begin with, with fabulous feasts and some of those sorts of things. They, they didn't take us seriously. A lot of that had to do with the fact that um, from a modern perspective, cooking is a is a woman's art and there's a ton of misogyny in higher education. It's also because it's a very um, cross curricular activity. Food historians I think in general fall into a few different camps of, re of research or approach. Scully for instance is very, very much a textualist. So he's, and Milham for that matter, they're very much looking at the texts of the cookbooks. They're interpreting the language. They're looking at the publishing um, histories and they're coming at it from a text standpoint. It, we're starting to move a little bit more into more of an experimental archaeology model. And there's some great frameworks to think about. And there's actually some um, books that I'll, we'll look at when we get into the research section that um, lay out experimental archaeology framework for cooking. And then there's also people that approach it sort of from a um, multi-dimensional standpoint. So for instance, Ken Albala, Dr. Ken Albala, who teaches at um, uh, University of the Pacific in um, Sacramento, he came from the medical standpoint because at the point that time period, all, you know, throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance, food was considered um, medicinal in some respects that you needed to balance people's humors. I'm not going to get into that because it's a long, long discussion. So he's approached it starting from a, um, a history of medicine standpoint. He's incredibly good at the um, translation as well. And he cooks and you can see that in, in most of his books um, where it, it really um, covers the whole spectrum. But then we also have people that are interested in it from an agricultural standpoint. So we have sort of this agricultural 
sphere of people studying food. And then we have it from an archeological standpoint and then a, a, a cultural standpoint. So it's really an interesting field because it's incredibly cross-curricular. And the people that can think outside their speciality are really the ones that are, are um, exploding the uh, food history um, research because they're not just thinking as it from a text or they're not just thinking of it from a medicine standpoint or a agricultural standpoint they're bringing other aspects into their research and it's really it's really an interesting time in food history we have more re research and more books and more commentary on food history in the last 15 years than we did in the first 25 years of my existence in the SEA. We had very few resources to go from. And people are, are bringing an academic stance to it so we, can, we know where you got your research from. We know where the recipe is coming from. We can go back and look at it. We can, we can recreate it um, by looking at the research. So it's really, things are really progressing. I mean, when we started, I'm trying to see, I've got something here. It's probably over on this side. You know, we had to to the queen's taste and to the king's taste, and they do, they are, they're lacking in in citations. They're lacking in resources, and now we have things like you know, Milham that's just dense with resources and dense with um, citations. So, but bef before we move on to the, the books themselves, I also wanted to just talk about secondary resources. I'm mostly talking about Italian right now because I'm sitting here and all my Italian books are right here because they're the ones I use the most. So we will get into other books, but I, the, I'm pulling from here because it's fast and easy. So secondary resources are just books that talk in general about food history or a specific time period. Um, and aren't necessarily a cookbook. And I say primary resource, I really am using that as a stand-in for a cookbook. Now, from a secondary resource standpoint, for instance, and I'll pull one of Ken's books, um, if I can find it. Oh, here we go. Now, I like this one a lot, mostly because he has he's dedicated it to me well and a whole bunch of other people but um eating right in the renaissance secondary resource it's not a cookbook it just talks about food in the renaissance so um really important to look at to sort of fill in the blanks because a cookbook is an only it's only going to give you a certain amount of information because it's intended starting to be intended in the Renaissance, not so much in the Middle Ages, Start in, starting to be in, used as a, a practical book. It's being used to convey information about specific dishes, but not the context around it. So secondary resource books like this, Eating Right in the Renaissance, is, are great because it gives you a, a clearer and bigger picture. Excellent, oh my God. He looks so young in this picture. Um, uh, we met at, at Oxford when I gave my first paper at Oxford. So he's got a great bibliography. It's separated into primary resources and secondary resources. So you know, you know they, he's taken a lot of time with it. It's not annotated, most of them aren't. It's got a great index and the chapters are, are um, pretty fabulous. This is a uh, a good secondary resource to look at. So don't dismiss those kinds of books. There are a lot that were written in the late Victorian time period, early early um, 20th century that maybe you don't wanna take a look at, but um, it's worth noting and worth knowing that they're there. So I'm just gonna take a real quick question break on anything we talked about so far, and then we're gonna tour the shelves of, and I wonder how I'm going to do this because I shut down my camera. And I'll show you what I have in terms of books in my collection. And then you can ask questions about any of them. I guess you could just pick up your laptop. Maybe. Yeah, I'm going to just join again on my camera here. Okay. So you probably have to let me in. No problem. 
Um, oh, I have to get internet connection again first though. There we go. Um, so are there any other, any questions about the first stuff that we've talked about? So the, the only question I have right now is um, as someone coming back into medieval culinary research, I'm interested in good resources related to pre-1500 Europe in the last decade or so. Yeah, so the third section that we're going to talk about, um, let me see here. So have you got my camera? Oh, but I don't have video. There. The third section that I'm going to talk about, um, we'll get into that and you can ask questions specifically and I'll pull specific books off the shelf. And you can sort of, as we go through this, you'll be able to see sort of what books that I do have. Um, okay, so we're going to start. Down. All right, let me, let me just switch the uh, camera now. Hang on just one second. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, and you can all still hear me and see me? Yep. Okay, so I want to start up here. So this is the section on, um, it originally was just going to be um, history, food history journals and PPCs, but as you can see, PPC has taken over all of this shelf. So this is my collection of PPCs. PPC stands for Petis Propus Culinaris, and it's a little food history magazine journal from England, um, and it's an excellent resource. It does not always cover um, stuff that we might be interested in pre 16th century or 17th century. It goes um, into a sort of early modern time period as well, but it's well worth having a subscription to or getting it out of your library. The second shelf down here, and we can look at these more in depth, when you ask about them, are food history journals. So I've got journals from all sorts of um, different places. RSA, this is the RSA one. Um, I've got the ones from different food history symposiums. This is the Edinburgh ones. Collections of German studies, those sorts of things. All the Oxford symposium papers. Now these are all online and all free after two years. They're published for two years and then they're free online. I have, oh, some of the ones from this year's symposium that haven't been printed yet. And then a little bit of a, of a layover for my Italian food history. So I've got Italian weights and measures. And then this is um, Florio, which is an Italian to English dictionary that I use in my translations. That really belongs on this shelf down here, which is the start of my um, mostly Martino references. So this is all Martino. These are uh, microfilm copies of, of the Epilario. This is the Library of Congress and the Vatican um, editions of Martino. I've got Valine's um, Plotina and the Rebirth of Man. This is the 1518. So this is all things related to Martino. You can see too, I, I'm starting to run out of space on this shelf. And then this goes down into Italian history, food history. So lots of different things from Messembugo to Arte della Cucina, which has multiple different ones. Um, all, all um, you know, kitchens, cooking and eating in medieval Italy. This is all Italian stuff. This is a really, really interesting, fun book. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Let me see. This is, there you go. It's Leonardo's Kitchen Notebook. It's a joke. And I don't mean like it's really bad. I mean, it's actually a joke. So I've seen several people have this in their bibliography. And this is just, a, this is a joke book on Leonardo's um, kitchen. And I'll pull that out. We'll take a look, deeper look at that in a little bit, and I'll show you why. So after that, we go up to this top shelf here, which is more Italian, up to about here. And I'm starting to, you know, overflow my bookshelf here. Um, and I, need, I need some more space in the Italian section. Um, after Italian, we go into ancient cookery. So I have a lot of different things on uh, ancient Rome, obviously. It's a very um, prolific 
time period that people like to write about, but I've also got ancient Greek in here, um, Galen, um, all the ancient sort of cookbooks are here. And then we go down in here, some more ancient and then sort of the biblical, there was a time period where people were really writing a lot about biblical food. After that, I have the French food history and I've got about a half a shelf of that and it's starting to overflow as well. So French, French comes in here and then I start down into the eat Middle Eastern cook, cookery books. Um, Indian, all things that sort of are from the Middle East or um, that uh, the Fertile Crescent area. I also have a few things now starting into into Japanese cookery. This is excellent. Um, this is a fun dissertation. I'll bring this up too. And then you can see this is starting to also get a little cr cramped. This is West African food. Oh, this is really bad. There we go. West African food in the Middle Ages is a dissertation. Um, very hard to find book. I'll bring that out so we can look at it in more depth. And then I start into sort of what I've called mixed countries and cultures. So I've got Dutch and um, the Icelandic, Danish, Polish, Russian, things that are just one-offs that I have, this little beautiful cookbook. Um, and then down here we start into general history. Um, so art of dining, I've got a few things that don't fit anywhere else. The Horizon Cookbook, which is um, uh, overview and history of cooks. Of course, Tannehill is probably in here somewhere, which is a, a, a history, there it is. Food in history, the great cooks. It's sort of just a generalized, generalized, um, shelf of food history. We go over a little bit. I'm hoping I'm not making you too sick. Then we also have continuation of general food history. Another whole big shelf of that. And then one over here on, the, on herbs and spices, history of herbs and spices, agricultural, that sort of thing. So that's that one side. If we turn over here, you can see that in general, the most, um, most books, the most we have is on the history of English cooking. It's more accessible, there's more scholarship in it, and it's easier to read and it's published more. So we've got Tudor cooking, Digby, oh, the English housewife, that's Markham, all sorts of things. And then I don't know why these are in here, but maybe because they didn't fit anywhere else. Just specific topics. We've got Eleanor Fetty Place, um, you know, Kings and Queens Taste, the culture of food in England, more England down here um, as well. And then we get into sort of food history re references. So I put some more in um, English dictionaries. This one is on um, food history studies. This is an amazing book. I will bring that one out too and talk to you about it. It's biting. It's a, a book. It's just a whole book on um, a bibliography. There's my young apprentice before she was no longer young. Um, we move down here a little bit more and then these are specific products and that's where the corn should go. I don't know why it's up there. Um, and cod, things that are specific, potatoes, Ken's book on beans, butter, just specific histories of, of specific products are down here. Um, and then down a little bit further, I've got history of bread, history of preserving, history of brewing, and then I have a few sort of Norse, you can see I said Norse-ish, really the only one that's truly Viking or Norse is the early meal, but, but Anglo-Saxon and then a modern um, Scandinavian cookbook that's a good reference. The bottom shelf is um, early America and so we're not going to look at that a lot, but I, I um, in a lot of my um, 
newspaper columns. I wrote a lot about um, early American food, so that's down there. And then the final shelf, and I don't know if I can reach it, is really 1700s and Victorian. So um, that's the extent of the food history collection. But you can see there's a lot more cookbooks, twice as many maybe cookbooks. This whole section is um, all my different cookbooks. So you can switch back to the other camera. So uh, Garama's asking, do you have any Armenian? Armenian, there are, as far as I know, there are not any extant Armenian cookbooks that have been published. I'm sure, I'm just picking up some of the papers that have fallen on the ground. I am sure that there are some in existence. Um, but um, digging them out of a library, digging them out of a uh, someone's someone's um, attic or something like that, um, we just we don't have any that are published um, at this point. You'd have I could give you some places to start to look, um, but of course the, we also have to consider how much damage there was done in that region and and how much. Um, might or may or may not exist anymore. Um, so I ha I don't I have never seen seen anything that's been published. Um, you might look at start by looking at um, travel logs. Very popular. What time period specifically? It may take a minute to get a response. Here. Okay. Travel logs were very popular in the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance, so you might be able to find something there. Obviously, also like um, inventories or wills, things like that, you would find, you'd start to maybe find some clues, but I've never seen anything. If anybody else has seen anything Armenian, um, that would be great. We have very little from a standpoint of um, Chinese, Japanese, um, Russian, we've got the Domestra, that's about it. Um, there, there's got to be more. We're just not, you know, we're finding new things every day. So it, it's just a matter of time. Like for instance, you know, um, Glenn just had the wonderful Transylvanian slash Hungarian cookbook that hadn't been translated that we didn't really know about. And one little tidbit led him to the manuscripts and, and um, now we have a translation. It's a, it's, it's fabulous. I'm going to shut this one off. Um, so um, new things coming out every day, but Armenian, I don't know anything about. I wanted to just show you this book is really an important, and it was in my. Oh, I did, I did get a response finally. So medieval period is what she's looking yeah, for. Yeah, um, I, you know, I haven't seen anything from that time period, but you, if it's late medieval, you could start to look at um, written records because they were starting to, to take to keep more records um, from a standpoint of wills and travel logs and um, journals and diaries and those sorts of things. Um, and that might lead you to a cookbook, um, but I haven't seen anything in Armenian. Um, this book is from the resources. So this is typically called just biting. Um, it's a gastron gastronomic bibliography. So it's a whole, you can see how big it is. It's just a whole, it's just a bibliography on historical cookbooks, all sorts of cookbooks. So obviously you have to know what you're looking for, but you can look anything up. So let's see, we'll look up um, Oh, let's find something really interesting. Um, here's one. It's out of our time period. It's the 1700s, but it says it's by Elizabeth Price. Price Elizabeth, the new universal and complete confectioner. And so she's got all the bibliographic information about that book. This is an excellent resource. It's, it's also a little hard to find. When is it from? Somebody was wondering when it's from. Um, it was originally printed in 1939. Um, and there's a couple of different ones like this. So this is a good one. And then if you're looking at 
just Italian um, cookbooks. This is a similar type of book. It's called The Hand List of Italian Cookery Books. And it's not quite as big, um, but it has all the different um, cookbooks that were known at the time period um, and all the different editions. So this is great if you're looking at Plotina or anything like that. And this um, is a great resource as well. Um, the introduction, et cetera, is in Italian, but the bibliography itself is in the original language and that's easy to it's easy to figure out it's an and it's in english so for instance let's see we'll look up martino who's this i made some notes in here about different um things here's one that deals with um an italian cookbook that's slightly out of period and it deals with cocoa and chocolate so he's got a little bit of an annotation on these as well. There's books on wine, there's books on um, all sorts of different things. A treatise on the nature of wine. Here's one from 1586. Um, lots of great information, but it's just a bibliography. The entire book is a bibliography, which makes my heart pitter patter because it's just amazing. We had two other, uh, um area so somebody was looking for um spanish and someone was looking for jewish yeah so spanish the best resource that we have for spanish is juana isabella de montoya ramirez who's on here donna hello go to her um i don't have a lot of spanish cookbooks i do have a few um but really um she's the one to look for i have where did i put spain i have a few things but i'm not going to talk about any Spanish cookbooks, because I'll embarrass myself. She's the, really the one that you need to Oh, talk. she's the one that asked. <laughs> oh, for God's sakes, Donna. Yeah, go to her. That's who you should go to. Um, I don't, um, when I need something from, about Spanish cooking, that's who I go to. Like, seriously, she knows um, the most in the SCA about Spanish cooking, and she's connected to um, the people that are really doing the research on Spanish cooking. What would you recommend, Donna? We'll wait for her answer. And what was the other question? Um, Jewish. Jewish. So there's, there's not a lot. So there's a, been recently, and my Jewish cookbooks are probably upstairs because it was just Rosh Hashanah. Um, there's been this new cookbook that was just came out and was publicized all over the internet and Facebook about how it was the um, a treasure trove of ancient um, Jewish cooking passed down. So I have that book. It's not, it's, it's their family recipes that she's made a huge amount of supposition. Or maybe not, we don't know because there's no bibliography, there's no citations, there's nothing that would s support or suggest that it's a medieval or Renaissance um, cookbook. Uh, I don't know of any specific kosher or Jewish cookbooks from our time period, but that being said, there is a lot of information about um, uh, the 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 when the the Jew, Jews were expelled from Spain and how s lots of pork was used in different um, cookery books so that they could um, route the Jews out and find out if they were really converting or not. Um, but I don't know of any specific Jewish cookbooks. If somebody else does, please put it in the chat because I'd love to get some. Um, but I haven't found any. It's a lot of supposition. You can find out a lot of information from- Drizzle of honey? So I have a drizzle of honey and the drizzle of honey is okay. Now, where is it? Um, but it's not as academic as I would like it to be. There's some really big jumps um, in it and some, some big assumptions that aren't necessarily supported. And drizzle of honey is, where can I put my, see, I thought with all my organization, I would be able to put my hand on it really fast. Is it upstairs? I don't know. It may be upstairs because of, um, because of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I made a big feast for breakfast. So um, drizzle of honey is, is certainly a good place to start. I'd look in the bibliography and see if there's a, if there are things that are 
more specific um, or that will support the assumptions, but it's not, it's not as, and it, and it also is older. So, um, you know, there may be some newer research that has been done. Um, so I had uh, uh, Greek late 1400s to 1510. So um, Byzantine-ish um, cooking, there's a few things. Most of the stuff is, on, is ancient though. Let's, let me pull some stuff down. So most of it is ancient Greek rather than um, rather than um, Byzantine. Now there was one Byzantine one that was put together by a SCA person. Is this it? No. Um, that's not bad, but um, also an area that needs way more study is that Greek. Um, you know, this is really good. It's um, Galen, but it's ancient again. And then um, I like courtesans and fish cakes just as a secondary resource, good bibliography, um, quite um, a good overview. But from that time period, you're going to have to start looking for manuscripts that have come out of the libraries from that um, location and time period. I don't have a lot on that. I'm wondering where that Byzantine one is. I don't know. Oh, I think I found it. No, that's early American. I don't know where the Byzantine one is. Um, With so many books, sometimes I... It gets hard I, to find. <laughs> um, medieval Ireland. Medieval Ireland. You know, we don't have any um, Irish cookbooks until later in, in, um, in um, outside our time period. There are uh, Irish, Scottish, right outside, like 1650. We start to have um, some... Um, more regionalized English food or British Isles food. We have the um, the Scottish Gardener, which is 15, 1652-ish, I think. Um, but Irish, we don't have any Irish cookbooks. You're going to have to build Irish food from the archaeological um, record, which is very difficult because if you think about it, in Ireland at the time period, and I'm stealing this from Tanguistle, um, they had fish, they had seaweed, they had access to rice, so they could make sushi. They probably didn't, but they could. So you had to be careful when you're looking at what are the raw ingredients and putting them together. You have to contextualize them to the time period. You know, look at English food from that time period. Look at look at um, the availability and also the time the 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 status of the person that's eating it is going to be different as well. Um, so we don't, there's no Irish cookbooks that I'm aware of. Is anyone else aware of any? Put it in the chat if you are. So I'll, um, so I looked at the biting. Oh, I wanted to show you this, the Leonardo notebook, right? So when I said it's a joke, I don't mean like a joke from a research standpoint. I mean, it's a joke. He's put it together. Look here, he's got a machine from Da Vinci. This one, this, this contraption up here, I hope you can see it okay. It's one of Da Vinci's drawings and it says, Leonardo's device for eliminating frogs from drinking water. When the frogs hopped onto the baited trap, a hammer would deliver a blow to its head and continue delivering such blows until the frog became unconscious. Multiple versions of the same are shown. So he's just, it's just, uh, it's just a, a book that he's taken Leonardo's drawings and then um, made up fantasy things about food and cooking. Um, but I have seen this as in the bibliography of an arts and sciences paper on cooking. And then he talks about, you know, porcupine, how to cook porcupine. The meat of the porcupine tastes like that of the hedgehog and the people of the Po use it as a laxative. It's just, it's not a real book. It is totally a, a humorous book. It's, 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 it's meant to be humorous, but I like to keep it as an example. The only really, really bad one from an Italian perspective, besides this one, um, that I've also seen used as a resource uh, is um, the Frugal Gourmet Cooks Three Ancient Cuisines. 
So I've seen people use that in their ancient Roman research. It's, it's, it's not an ancient Roman cookbook. It's just him getting a fancy dancy title and trying to pull you in. He uses tomatoes in his ancient Roman cooking. And we all know that that was impossible. So I really avoid that one. Um, but any other ones, you know, um, there's some such great ancient Roman cookbooks out there now. Don't even worry about that. This one, the West African medieval food. These are really good um, place to find esoteric information is um, abstracts and dissertations because you can find all sorts of great ones. West African food in the Middle Ages. Like seriously, I know I just think I saw or Tati M say something, but I don't know what she said. Um, it's a dissertation that someone's put together and it's been bound, but you can, you can find all sorts of great information uh, in people's dissertations. So, a, sorry, my, my microphone stopped working. Um, <laughs> so somebody had posted, um, Meals in Early Judaism, Social Formation at the Table by S. Well, that would be great. And that would be a secondary, let me write that down because now of course I'm gonna have to get it. Of course. <laughs> what was it called? Meals in Early Judaism, Social Formation at the Table by S. Marks and H. Tausig, T-A-U-S-S-I-G. Yeah, and there's probably actually, someone's probably written a thesis or a dissertation on um, Jewish food in the Middle Ages or Jewish food in the ghettos of Venice or Jewish food. There's, there's likely to be lots of information out there not in um, in um, easily published works, but in dissertations and those sorts of things. And there's likely to be lots of articles in PPC. The nice thing about PPC is if you do only want to get a few of PPCs, get these ones. The number 76, number 66, number 46, number 36, and number 16. Why do you think I want you to get just these ones? These have the index for all the other ones. So every six, every 20 editions, they put out an index. And 76 is a really good one to have because one of my articles is in there. But the, these are good because you can have, you can go through and, and look at all of the articles that are in all of the um, PPCs. So these are the ones to have. Do you want me to repeat those? No, um, so uh, they wanted to mention um, Katie or Judith um, in East Kingdom uh -huh. for, um, for Jewish food resources, that she's a good person to look at for, um, for that. Katie. If you have her, if you have the, uh, a um, website or something like that, put that in the chat, that would be great. It looks like it's Judith Bas Rabbi Mendel is in East Kingdom. Let's see who they're talking about. Now, this is awful because I can't see the, the chat. <laughs> There's a link there. Oh, good. So, yeah. Can you repeat the, the so I, that you so were that talking about? So, er, or Tatium says that um, she's a she's a laurel in Jewish food. Does she like cover herself in food? Is that like she's in the Jewish food or? Oh my goodness, Eduardo. <laughs> um, so you want me to repeat the num the the ones that have the indexes? So number sixteen has an index from uh, all the previous ones. Number thirty six. Number forty six number 66, and number 76. Those all have the index for the rest of them. And right now it goes up to like 119, I think. The one that we just got is beside my bed. Um, sep oh, 117 or 100, 118 or 119 is what we're up to from an addition standpoint. All the Oxford Symposium papers, I'll pull one of those. Um, oh, I'll pull this one. The meal, all of them are from different years. So this one was from 2001, um, are all online. They're all available for you, except for the last two, I think, two years 
or maybe three years. Um, but Ox, the symposium um, makes them available to people. And so you can go online. There's not an index that I'm aware of, but you can search through them um, right from the very beginning of the, of the symposium in 85, I think, um, right to the current one, which just happened last month and several of us were <coughs> did the virtual symposium this year, which was brilliant and lots of and lots of fun. It was great that we had that opportunity in 2001 when I wrote um, this paper on uh, from menu to meal, from from menu to recipe to meal. It's on a Renaissance wedding banquet. 9/11 um, happened. The, um, day before I was to fly out. So we, I couldn't attend, half the conference couldn't attend. But this year with the virtual, with the virtual conference, we had um, over, we had about 500 people, which is more than um, we usually have in person. And um, it was, it was just great. So look for these. They're the um, Proceedings of the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery published by Prospect Books. And if you go to their website, oh, somebody put it in there, yeah. Um, you can find um, all of those online, which is a really great resource. And there's probably somebody's probably done something on Jewish food. I don't think there's any Armenian food, but that means that you get to write something about it. <laughs> so, um, so you know, for for my own personal, you know, persona, um, is there anything else that you know of besides an early meal that is a decent resource for? Yeah. Uh, so, for nurse or early nurse, you know, food. So not early, not early Norse. Okay, so for Norse, really, this is the the one um, to go to an early meal in case anybody hasn't heard of it. It's based on different um, archaeological finds, and um, basically, it's it's, um, it's super interesting. Constructed. It's a. It's really interesting. It's mostly a experiment, you know, it comes from an experimental archaeology archaeology standpoint. Uh, it's a great start, but if you're looking for something um, to supplement that, it's sort of a little bit in the late Norse Viking period. Um, it's really Anglo-Saxon, but really um, Anne Hagen's um, two volume set, a handbook on Anglo-Saxon food processing and consumption, because we know that, you know, the Norse and the Anglo-Saxon um, and the um, Norman, that whole culture sort of merged together at that point. So there's some good things in here. And this is on food processing and consumption. And this is on um, production and distribution. It's excellent book. And I, if you're, if you're going to do anything on Norse besides an early meal, I would recommend that. What was the second one? Well, so there, it's a two volume set. It's by Anne Hagen, H-A-G-E-N. And it's a handbook on Anglo-Saxon food. That's what both of them are called. And one is subtitled production and distribution. And the other one is subtitled um, processing and consumption. really, really good. And really, the own, you know, it's not a cookbook, but it just gives you lots and lots of information about the archaeological record and the writ, what little written record and the cultural record. And it's, they're just really good books to have. It gives, it's going to give you a perspective from a later time, slightly later time period than you're interested in but you're not gonna find anything except an early meal and maybe an occasional archeological um, scholarly article in, some, in, an, in a journal. Um, you're gonna have to piece things together a lot. Um, and I guess, and I think that really um, we're doing more experimental archeology span when it comes to Norse foodways than um, the, the, the food history community is right now. It's not something that's being studied a lot in those circles because it's not as accessible. It's sort of the archeologists are doing some really good work and the recreationists are doing some good work and they're not come, they haven't come together as, as tightly as they could 
and and formed more of a scholarly um, uh, uh, take on things. So, sorry. It's my life. It's fun. <laughs> But, you know, seriously, in t 10, 15 years, who knows? Because when I first started in the SCA thir 37 years ago, there was no, there was nothing in Italian, there was nothing on Italian food. There was nothing that, you know, it was all English. If there was anything, it was English food. There was very little Italian food. So there's hope there, you know, pe people's interests um, change uh, or we get some new research and, um, I'd love some love to do uh, a, a piece. I just don't have time on um, food in the um, sagas, and there may be a dissertation out there. Somebody may have already done something around foodways or in the in the sagas. Um, one of the pieces in PPC, and I actually think it's in this one, is a um, uh, uh, article that um, Eden. And I don't know if she's on here or not. Eden Rain and I wrote called Drunkards, Belly Gods, and Servants of the Paunch. It's food references in Florio's translation of the Decameron. So we took the Decameron, um, Florio's translation, which was great because we have his dictionary as well. And we cataloged every single food reference that was in the 10 days and the 10 stories per day and looked at all of the food his food references and there's 1600 different food references in them. So that gives you an, uh, a different perspective, um, a different um, view into food. And I'd like to do that with the sagas, but um, maybe when I retire. Um, somebody asked about uh, any recommendations regarding Eastern European. Eastern European. So there's a couple of different ones. You know, the one that everybody looks at is this food and drink in Poland. Um, fairly good. Um, and oh, my dog just crawled out from underneath the couch. I didn't know he was there. Um, food and drink in Poland. Um, is that that's what you mean by Eastern European? Because I'm, I'm just making some assumptions. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then somebody put the domest, the the Russian one. Slight, I think this is 1610, but we still it's one of the only ones we have. Of course, the Transylvanian cookbook, or Hungarian, Transylvanian, Eastern. These are really good ones. Um, those are the three that I that off the top of my head I would pull out. Um, who else, was anybody putting anything else? Yeah, look, Medieval Food and Drink in Poland. Oh, it's available apparently in PDF. Um, I don't I'm pretty know. much seeing the same ones that you pulled out of your bookcase. Yeah. So, and then it happens that they're right here because this is sort of the ones, the one-offs, or I guess, well, yeah, they're one-offs, Russian, Polish, Transylvanian. So let's see, what else do I have here? Um, although that goes, starts to get into German food. Any anybody else? Any other any other books you want me to pull out and look at and or make recommendations? I mean, we've got a great group of people on the call that have you know that have specialties in all sorts of different areas. That one doesn't go there. Uh, but the other one that I'd had earlier was interested in good resources related to pre fifteen hundred Europe from the last decade or so, because they had knowledge from before that. They were just curious as to what good has come out in the last decade, pre-1500 Europe. Pre-1500 Europe, that's a very large and wide area. In the last 10 years, I mean, there's been so much good research. Um, the, uh, the one that I would, are you like looking for English or Italian or, I mean, the, the ones that have come to spring to mind immediately, of course, are Sente Solve, excellent. Um, resource last 10 years probably. Let's see when it was printed. Okay, find all sorts of little pieces of paper in these books. This was published in oh, 2008, so that's a little bit um, later than that, uh, later than your 10 years. Um, m a lot of stuff that's come out recently is the Middle Eastern um, 
and Syrian and Persian and those sorts of cookbooks. Um, lots of good new research on that. Um, uh, French cookbook that's recent that's recently come out a translation by Ken and um, Tim um, Timothy Tomeska. Um, this is 2014. This is an excellent translation. Things are coming out fast and furious from that perspective. So to say general pre 1500s 15th century, I think you said actually um, first things come out usually in a paper or a journal and then are expanded into different works. So I like that. I really like this series by Catherine McGi um, McIver, um, her Cooking and Eating in the Renaissance, Cooking and Eating in the Middle Ages. Those are really good books. Um, cooking, here's another one, Cooking, Kitchens Cooking and Eating in Medieval Italy. These are fairly new. Let's look at the dates. This is 2017, so that's a really good new one. Um, keep up to date if you're not on the cooking lists, the SCA cooking lists. Um, that's good to be on because we often, as soon as something comes out, it's all over that. This is 2015, so I would say these are really good, but again, those are Renaissance and um, medieval, not um, pre-1500s. I'm not very, um, I wouldn't say I'm not interested, but it's not my specialty. So I, I really focus around 1450 to 1510, maybe a little bit later because I love Scopy so much, but um, that's my main um, period of interest. Does anybody else have anything? Actually, yeah, there was 14th century travel foods, English or French. Ooh, I don't have that. Wait, now I have to write that down too. No, that was a question. Oh, for oh, <laughs> a book. That'd be a great uh, book. <laughs> Fourteen. Um, no, you're there. Uh, there's nothing that I know of from that. You're going to have to look from a standpoint of. Um, wait, there might be one chapter in this book. The Culture of Food in England from 1200 to 1500. This is fairly new. I have, for some reason, two copies of it. <laughs> um, probably because I didn't know I had a copy. It's from 2016. Um, so you might find some things. There's some things in here on the monastic. Let's look at the, the um, index. Illustrations, weights and measures. Preface. Oh, great. There's no, there it is. Table of contents. So there's one on cooking in the countryside, um, drinking and dr the culture of drink and drinking, breads, meats, and dairy foods. This one might be helpful for you from that specific standpoint. There's civic food and culture, monastic institutions, lots of things that might be useful to you, but I, there, nothing specific. There's an SCA one. Uh, Juan Isabella says, uh, for travel food, there's a work in Spanish on tavern, tavern food. <laughs> well, tavern food, that would be takeout, not travel. There's an SCA one on traveling dishes. Um, it's, an, it's fairly old. It's by Sheehan O'Rourke, um, and it was printed in 96. Um, does have the originals. It's pretty... Um, SCA specific and it mixes a lot of um, different cuisines. So for instance, it has <coughs> um, a, a, a recipe from form of curry and then it has the sekunjabin from um, the Middle Eastern um, Andalusian cookbook. Um, so it's not, I don't know if it would be really useful um, but it is one thing that's specific on travel foods. What's the, I'd love to know more about the, the tavern food cookbook. Is it a cookbook, Juana, or is it like a, a, a paper on, on tavern food? 
Oh, traveling dishes is meant for what to bring to a potluck. Oh, okay, I see what you see. Um, so lots and lots and lots of good SCA cookbooks um, on um, putting things together for a potluck. If you're doing a potluck um, and you're not doing a lot of research, you just want to make something, um, the Feudal Gourmet by the um, Madrona Culinary Guild, I think they've stopped shipping during COVID, but their series has some things to um, take to potlucks. Um, I'm just going to pull off the SCA cookbooks. Um, how to cook for Soothly. I don't even know if the SCA publishes this anymore, but there's lots of good recipes in that. Lionsgate cookbooks, the Madrona Culinary Guild's cookbooks before they started producing the Feudal Gourmet. Um, if you um, are looking for things to, uh, to take to a um, potluck, of course, um, Karaidox Miscellanea is really good. Oh, this is not. This is not an SCA one, but it got put in. It's a noble book of cookery. It needs to get re, re um, done, and then serve it forth. I don't know if you can get this anymore. It's a good one um, that was put together by Mistress Rowena de Rossaval in Lionsgate. Lots and lots and lots of good things to put from an SCA perspective on what to bring to a potluck. If that's what you meant, I think that's what you meant by traveling food. <coughs> Um, let's see here. There's a lot of just general conversation happening in the, uh, in the chat right now. <laughs> culinary. Yeah. The, these are the ones from the Madrona culinary guild that have just been put here, but I do think that they've stopped shipping during COVID. Uh, and for people who are watching the recording of this, I'm going to grab the links that are being added in the chat and I'll, um, and I'll add them to the blog post so that, uh, so they're available. Okay, let's see. Well, we've been going for, what, an hour and a half. Are there any other questions? Let me see, did we cover everything on my list? I think we did, unless people want me to pull other things off the shelf. Um, somebody wants to know what everyone's favorite Ottoman. Everyone's favorite Ottoman cookbook? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll let or Tati put that in. Yeah, I wouldn't know. I don't have, I don't think I have any Ottoman. Well, I guess maybe, no. I mean, it's also interesting to think about like, how are you defining that word versus others defining that word? It's really an interesting thing to think about. Like when you say Ottoman, do you mean a specific time period and place? Do you mean a general culture? That sort of thing. Um, lots of good um, new Persian book, Persian cookbooks that have come out. Um, this one, I just purchased this one. I haven't even read it. Um, the Land of Five Flavors. This is a this is a um, Chinese cuisine, the cultural history of Chinese cuisine. So um, quite interesting. The only other one we have really is Soup for the Quan, which is very Mongolian influenced because of the time period. Um, so really inter two interesting books. La you know, if you don't have medieval Arab cookery, also a great book from that time period, multiple different um, essays and translations of cookbooks, um, some by Charles Perry, um, excellent book to have. Indian, the only real Indian cuisine that we have is a new food of life and it's really Persian. Uh, it's, it's, that's Persian. The, this is the Indian food, a historical um, companion. Also fairly difficult to get um, by a, a chaya um, uh, and really the only history of Indian food. Any others I've translated? Yeah. I'm not really seeing any questions um, as much as just general chat.
Does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, here we go. Can you talk about recreating recipes based on primary resources? We discussed early period being really hard to document, um, really hard to document. So what is acceptable documentation for a competition contest? Uh, for instance, combining word definitions, available cooking methods and paintings, such as um, braggot as spice ale using uh, spices available in the vicinity in the area. Yeah, so it, you know, much depends on the contest that you're entering or where the venue that you're entering things into. I would always say make sure that you look at the rubric for the contest before you um, start in on your research. Make sure that you're following it. And from the early period stuff, it's going to be, you're going to have to support your conclusions in multiple different ways. So um, if you just take your spiced ale perspective, and especially if you're trying to push it early, 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 and there's no written resources for it, um, you're going to have to create a thesis and support it very well. Um, the problem with recreating food from those that time period out of out of whole cloth or out of bits and pieces of other researches that you've got to remember to overlay the cultural context, the medical context, because there's things that they just didn't use together because of the medical context and because of the humoral theories and those sorts of things. You've got to think about the economic economic stratus that they're in. So there's lots and lots of things that you're going to have to think about besides just you want to create spiced ale and they had these, they had ale, maybe, you know, prove that it was brewed in this way and they had these spices. So of course they threw them together. That's most of the time isn't going to cut it in any sort of context. You've got to be able to support all of those suppositions. And it's hard. Um, and um, you'll get angry because people will ask you questions that you didn't think about. But that's okay because that's all what it's all about is just ask a ton of questions to yourself. First, would this spice have been available? How expensive would it have been? Where would they have gotten it? Would they have mixed it with these other kinds of spices? Or was it you know, sort of forbidden because of the, the humoral natures of the two spices. There's so much to ask. And if you don't ask yourself those questions to begin with, someone may ask those questions of you when you're presenting your work. So it's a difficult, it's difficult. It's not an easy task. I, f I am just feeling confident about creating my own recipes from the Italian period. And I've been doing this for 25, 30 years and I've, I am immersed in the Italian corpus. And I only now am feeling that I can say, oh, I'll take these things and this is a plausible Italian Renaissance um, dish. It's an incredibly difficult. Start with sor source material. It will be much easier. And then with the source material, still support all of those things, support those ingredients, support the methodology, support it with journal, with articles and with diary entries and with paintings and with extant um, pieces of uh, utensils and those sorts of things. Start there and then just slowly grow yourself out because that's the way that you'll get more confident with it. I've just seen too many things that people think are plausibly medieval or plausibly um, Renaissance dishes that have major issues and problems with them. Start, start with what we know first and build out from there. Does that answer your question or help you a little bit? I don't know who asked. I, I'm guessing. So it, there's a lot of conversation going on. So you're not going to be able to find the question. Um, but uh, so somebody asked if you can publish a list of the books in your library, or at least those uh, you have referenced here. So can you I send me a maybe a list? Yeah, I have a bibliography ready to go. It's not current. It's not as current as it could be, but I'll send you that one. Uh, it's the bibliography I use when I teach this class in person. 
Um, so the other question is, are there recommended books for SCA people just getting started? Yeah, I would say start with, I love the medieval, the feudal gourmet series. That's a really good one. If you're just getting started, that's a hard question because now we have so many specific culture and time period cuisines. So I would say start with what are you interested in and find either a cookbook from that time period and place or a general book on the time period and place. And if you can't find that, maybe a surrounding culture um, and do that. Because if you're going, if you're approaching um, and a new person and you're approaching the SCA from a persona perspective, I've been in it too long, I don't do that anymore. But if you are, you're not gonna get excited about cooking unless you can find something that connects to your time period and place. So start with that. But if there's general books, the Feudal Gourmet series is excellent. They're, they've got a great recipes, lot, good research. They're very inexpensive compared to some of the other books. That's where I would say to start. Um, if you're interested in the Italian Renaissance and you just want an overview, Eating Right in the Renaissance by Ken Albala is excellent. Um, but it really, I would want to ask you some questions, like how, how familiar are you with cooking in general to begin with? Like, are you like a beginner cook and we need to support even the cooking skills first? Or are you a good cook, good modern cook, and you want to engage in general medieval food, general medieval food in England, general medieval food in, in France? What, what? like let's try to narrow it down a little bit first that's what i would suggest and then somebody's put the um, madrona culinary guild uh, facebook page and the website in the chat yeah and i'll be sure to add that to the blog too so that people can find it um so so there's not is there really one that like if somebody is curious just kind of curious about general medieval food um, besides the Madrona books, because I don't know if they're shipping, like you said, you're not sure if they're shipping right now. Um, one that somebody could get to just kind of. And do you want to cook? You want to cook out of it, or you just want information? I would say probably cook out of. Yeah. So if you don't want to cook out of it, food in early modern Europe is good. Um, if you want to cook out of it, if you want to cook out of it. You know, uh, there's a good one, uh, Mediterranean cuisine. Where do I put that? That is a good overview of uh, late medieval, early Renaissance cooking. It's a bit best down here. Um, the original Mediterranean cuisine by Barbara Santich. This is a good one. It gives you a nice overview. It's just from the Mediterranean standpoint. Um, and it gives you the original transcription in the original language, the translation, and then um, what we call the redaction or the modern recipe. So this is, I would say this is a good book. I don't know if it, is it still in print? Can someone look that up real quick and see if it's in print? Still, the binding falls apart on the, on <laughs> at least the first edition. Um, but this is a good one um, if you're just getting started, I think. We did get an answer from the person who asked the question originally. So um, they said, my time period and place is the same as yours. Um, I'm a good cook and grow most of my own veggies. I want to cook more authentically. I have, I have the one Madrona book. The one Madrona book on the talent, on which uh, Madrona one? The one on my, pa with my papers in it. I think that's the, probably the one. Well, I would still probably recommend Italian. Um, yeah, they said Italian. Yeah, it's the Italian. So those have two my two Oxford papers in them. Um, so those are good. Um, no, there are res good recipes in there. So there's one on the dogfish um, that was in '97, and the topic was fish, and it's a um, uh, there's multiple recipes because it talks about the dogfish recipe, but then it also talks about the sauces that are served with it, the agliata and the mustardo, the mustard. And um, 
So you've got three or four recipes in there. The wedding, the the meal, the one from the meal in 2001 is has much many more recipes because um, I take a, a menu from um, the late 1400s and pair it with recipes from Platina and Martino. Um, so those are, you know, that's a, give you a good start, but this one would be great. Um, let me see what else I've got here. From a, if you're looking at things that have already been redacted, um, there's not a lot in Italy in that time period. Most of the stuff ha is um, translations that have been done. Um, Italian cuisine, a cultural history is, is a good one to look at, but again, that gives you just an overview of the culture, not specific recipes. Um, and then um, the Martino collection, obviously Platina and Martino are related. The Martino um, translation that's the most easily available, but I'm not sure I like it the best is um, Prazin's, Jeremy Prazin's um, translation, The Art of Cooking. Um, I like Gillian Riley's translation better, and that's by Octavo Press, and it's a DVD, and it has the Library of Congress Martino next to her translation. Her translation, though, is very different from many of my translations because she's very British, so some of the word choices that she uses are different than I would choose but they're still really valid and good. Some of his word translations, I just, I don't uh, like a lot. But the, the foreword by Ballerini is excellent in this book. So you could get that, but again, it doesn't have a lot of, like, here's a recipe it, to cook from, a modern recipe, take this much of this and that much. It doesn't have that, it only has the original. Um, Anyone else out there that studies this time period that has stuff that they can recommend? Um, the PPC. Honestly, there have been some in the chat, but there's been a lot, so it's hard to kind of go through and. Yeah. The oh, Susan's saying that the CD, the Riley CD, is very, very unavailable, um, and I don't know where mine is right now. I can't find it since we moved last. It's here somewhere. Um, so, uh, oh, you spent the last two hours trying to find one? <laughs> um, sorry about that. It really is good. It's really the best. And the nice thing is about that DVD is you can zoom in on the um, Library of Congress um, edition of the Martino. So I have the, the Library of Congress edition in microfilm but it's hard to zoom in on it and um, sometimes when you're trying to translate and read the Italian you want to go is that really an I or is it an E and um, the Riley edition is great because you can zoom right in and, and really figure it out. Um, one thing that I would get if you if you're really interested in Italian well two books Italian um, Renaissance food history. The Florio, it's available online. So this is an English, uh, it's an Italian English dictionary from um, the Elizabethan time period. Um, but it's really, really helpful in translating and figuring out um, strange words. Yeah, so, oh, the Library of Congress Martino is surprisingly legible. Um, I'll get back to that in a second. So get the Florio or go online because this is a really helpful resource. Um, so you can look up any word and he translates it into English, um, which is fascinating because you it really um, helps you with the context and helps you think about, well, how are they thinking about these things in the time period? So Florio, it's called, um, that's that's sorry that's just what everybody calls it it's actually called a world of words um and it's it's available um online and then the other one if you're it's very hard to get um i don't know if it's been put online is italian weights and measures and actually he has um 
by um, Zupco. He has several different ones, not just only Italian weights and measures, but he has also all sorts of other things. So um, this is good because it gives you weights by region in Italy. So it tells you that in, um, if we look up um, a calva, it tells you how much that, how big that is or how, what the measurement is in all the different regions of the, of the Italian peninsula. So it's very, very helpful from um, figuring out weights and measures in your recipes. Uh, I could go on and on. What was I gonna say about, oh, the Vatican. So the Library of Congress and the Vatican edition, here's the Library of Congress edition that I just showed you with some, my notes, some notes. And then here is the Vatican edition of Martina, which is equally as beautiful to read. This one's actually even easier to read. Um, and there's lots of debate about which one came first. And I think, um, I think with a new article that I'm going to put out, um, I've proven that the Library of Congress edition was first because there's a scribal error in the Vatican in the egg section that jumps and skips a recipe. There are um, 14 egg recipes in the Library of Congress edition and there's only 13 in the Vatican edition. And it's um, interesting to look at because that it jumps, it combines the 13th and 14th recipe into one recipe and ma it makes no sense. Um, but the Vatican is really easy to read too, Susan. And those are both available um, if you, um, I was gonna say call, but if you email the Library of Congress and you email the um, Vatican, um, you can get um, microfilm copies. Probably so, get digital copies now. I'm going to say one more question because you're going to lose your voice if you continue this forever. Um, I, I, it's awesome and there's so many questions. But um, So somebody asked, anything on 11th or 12th century Aquitaine? So um, from a cookbook standpoint, there's nothing um, that early. So the earliest written thing that we can call a cookbook is around 11, 1150, 1160. That's as far back as we've pushed it, unless you go to the ancient Roman. Um, uh, there's nothing that I know of from the Aquitaine from that period, but someone else on the might know. Seven centuries of English cooking gets a bad rap, but I've used it a lot. Um, it, why does it get a bad rap? I, I don't even know if I have that. I have a lot of English cookbooks, but I don't have that one, I don't think, because it's not, I, it's just something I pick up when I see it. It's not something that I actually go out and look for. Um, I like, I really do like this new one, The Culture of Food in England. Um, that starts at 1200. Um, so that might be something that has a little bit on Aquitaine. It's not, um, <coughs> it's it's 1200 so it's right on the edge but there's there's very little from that time period it would be really fascinating to do something around the doomsday books or something around the the literature from that time period there may be lots of uh food references but there we don't have um cookbooks from that time period we do have ninth century um because of the bin because of the um the addition to the Apicius cookbook or Apician or whatever you want to call it, there was a, an addition to it that they think was written around um, the ninth century. So that's the earliest really. Um, and then um, all the ancient Roman stuff um, is, is much earlier. So there's really a gap between um, in, food, in, lots of, in lots of aspects of history, but especially in cooking. All right, I think that's everything. I'm guessing you'd like to take a breather, a break. A sure. <laughs> yeah, we've been going for a while now, so. And Almost wife, two hours. <laughs> my wife just told me to stand up, so. Okay, all right, well, so. Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions or anything, you know, the, the online food groups,
um, are really a good place to start. There's lots of people with um, very specific knowledge on specific things. So um, use those as a resource as well.